The advice and opinions expressed by the hosts of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Uh, our wonderful guest today, I'm so excited to talk with her because, you guys, I have not yet read this whole book, and, and this is a compliment. When I get a book and I, I like, go, okay, I'm not going to get to read the whole thing uh, before the interview because I'm not just skimming because I want to actually read everything, but what I've read so far, Game Changer. Love, love, love this book. The book is titled Self-Care for Autistic People. The author of it is Dr. Megan A. Neff. She's with us right now. She is a neurodivergent clinician, parent, and advocate. She works with late-in-life diagnosed autistic and ADHD people and creates mental health and wellness resources with the neurodivergent person in mind. She is a clinical psychologist, researcher, and writer who stumbled into becoming an ex, I love this, accidental Instagram therapist and content creator. In a constantly evolving digital and mental health uh, landscape, she often finds herself reflecting on what it means to be a human, a helper, and how we can show up for each other. How much do we love that? So, Dr. Neff, thank you so much for being with us and for joining us today. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. My I'm having like 10 divergent thoughts just from your last um, oh, eight minutes of talking. Okay. 10 minutes of talking. So I, I'm excited to be here and I think we'll have a lot to talk about. Yes. Well, I'm excited to hear what those neuro, neurodivergent thoughts are because I don't know if you heard me say at the beginning, um, everything we do here, uh, our, our whole why is to support individuals on the spectrum. And we don't always get it right. I'm the first person to admit that we don't always get it right. Um, and, and we're not always trying to get it right. We're always striving to show up and be there and support. So Absolutely. I'm autistic, and I don't always get it right. And I think when you're in this space, like becoming friends with public learning um, is, is a must. So, Love yes, I, I appreciate that sentiment. Well, so I don't know where to start now, but I kind of want to start with your story. Um, that you just said you identify as being autistic, and um, and I said in the bio that your particular um, sweet spot is helping people who are late diagnosed. Talk to us a little bit about how you came to understand your personal relationship with with this mm -hmm. spectrum. Absolutely, yeah. So this is becoming um, kind of a common story at this point, but that is the like child diagnosis to parent pipeline. Um, and so it was after the diagnosis of one of my children that I began looking into autism. I think my situation was a little bit more unique in the sense that when that happened, I was three weeks away from graduating with my doctorate in clinical psychology. So not only was this kind of a massive unearthing of um, coming to understand my child and myself, but also like everything that I thought I knew about autism and clinical training and realizing that a lot of the conceptions I had around autism from my training as a psychologist, I needed to rethink. And so that's ultimately then what led to me um, starting Neurodivergent Insights was this realization of, oh my goodness, we are missing so many people, particularly this last generation of autistic adults, so many women, people of color, genderqueer people. And so... Um, I wanted to get more education out there around non-stereotypical presentations, autism in adulthood, and so that's why I started Neurodivergent Insights, and then it just kind of blew up on me, and that's why I call myself an accidental Instagram therapist, because I didn't set out to do that. I just wanted to get information out there, and, and the world responded to it. Yeah. I mean, of course they would, because um, I think it's... I mean, this is going to sound hypocritical from me, but let me qualify. I think if you can hear the information from someone who is authentically on the spectrum, it's so much more powerful, right? Um, and I think for there were years, I remember when my kid was diagnosed and he was little, and I was like, I just would like to talk to one adult on the spectrum. And there was a time and a place, the internet was younger than it is now, 
when that was just not something I could just dial up and do. You know, that, that was a hard thing to come across. And then, of course, I started to find that, and, and I find that's when I'm the most inspired, when I'm actually talking to people who are themselves on the spectrum. So I think the question is, so why am I still hosting a show? But I will say this, I do think that there is a part of the experience that, that parents need guidance, um, and, and I think I still I have, I still I can affect a little bit of change there, but we also are producing podcasts now that are solely the insights of people on the spectrum. I'm really proud of that because uh, I, I want to retire myself out of a job. Uh, you know what I mean? Because I do think that the authentic voice is the one that's more worth listening, which is why I'm thrilled that you're on the show. Mm-hmm. And I, I mean, you you were saying you've been doing the show for 14 years, so I imagine you've seen so much change in the last 14 years in regards to the autism space. I think the word, I really like the word multiplicity, and I think when it comes to the autism community, that's a word that we are struggling to know how to embrace and that I think is really important we embrace. Um, I think right now we're seeing kind of this necessary pendulum swing of for so long um, non-autistic people were primarily speaking about autism, and we're, we're seeing a, a shift of that. Um, and I think that our community is navigating, like, how do we make space for all of these perspectives? Um, and and I think we need multiple voices in the conversation. And absolutely, I love that you are prioritizing, let's amplify lived experience and autistic voices. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's actually, we're kind of in a tough time in the autism community figuring out how we're going to make space for all of our experiences. Although it's crazy, right? Because the, the universe of, of the internet is so large. There's so much room. Um, and and I, I always keep saying, let's, let's hear from everybody who wants to be heard from, and then please take what you need and what you want. But I got to say, I feel like your book... Um, I just keep saying I love it. I, I feel like it has come at a right time with the right voice, with the right information in the right format. For people who watch the show, you know, I, <laughs> like there's a there's a phrase that I use around some books, and I go, "This is a great bathroom book." Now, please don't be offended by that. But I was taught in graduate school. I remember, you know, the first teacher in graduate school said, look, you're going to have to do so much reading on a regular basis. You're not going to have time to do all the reading. So the books that you really want to read, I want you to pick five of them and stick them on the back of the tank in the bathroom. And, you know, even if you only get to read for two minutes three times a day, you know, you're going to be enriched by it. And I think that sometimes, you know, people's days are so busy. I love a book where you can open it up to any page and go, oh, wow, here's something that's life-changing to me today, and I don't have to read the three chapters before to put this in context or the three chapters after, but there's, a, like, a real-life strategy right here that can help me today, and that is what your book does. And it's in verbiage that I think anybody can understand. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, please, like I said, please don't be offended, but I think it's a perfect bathroom book. I think everybody needs to get this and stick it on the toilet table. Now, or stick it on your night table, but if you find that it's gathering dust on the night table, then stick it in the bathroom. Hopefully you're not offended. Uh, I love that. No, not offended. <laughs> okay, so tell us a little bit about the, who is this book for? Because uh, I think it's for everybody. <laughs> tell us what your intent was as, as the author. You know, that actually means a lot to me to hear you say that you think it's for everyone. One of my concerns in writing it, I speak from my experience as someone who um, was diagnosed with autism level one. I don't have co-occurring intellectual disabilities. I do have dyslexia, but um, I don't have co-occurring intellectual disabilities. So I would be considered, like, I have lower support needs. So uh, that's actually one of the nuances I added is I'm, I'm, I'm speaking from my context and my clinical context and that those are the folks I work with. So I, I was curious, okay, are there things in here that's also going to resonate with with families and people who, are, who have higher support needs? Um, so that is a, a kind of disclaimer of it, is that um, that was my context in writing it. But I think it's 
for, it's geared for autistic adults and autistic teens, but I also think autistic parents, if, or parents of autistic, either autistic parents or parents of autistic people, will also have some aha moments just reading, because you, you get access to my mind and how I'm thinking about a lot of these things, and so I also think that it could lead to some good aha moments for parents and care- caregivers as well. Absolutely. I, I mean... I definitely think for those of you who have, um, as you said, those sort of level one teenagers and adults where you're, that you realize that there's a piece that might be missing and you're wanting to help them to really be able to access their world and feel empowered in it. This is a great book. This is a great graduation book. Uh, I honestly think it's great even for people that are adults that aren't on the spectrum. I don't know anybody that, look, uh, there's so many people who are coming out of the woodwork now and saying, oh, I I think I might be on the spectrum. I think I might be neurodivergent. And I think we got to be really careful with that. But I do want to say that everybody, I don't know anybody that could look at the whole criteria for an autism spectrum disorder and not say, oh, I have this one. But you just don't have all of them and you don't have them to the severity level that you would qualify for a diagnosis. But that doesn't mean you couldn't use help on some of these things. And it really, put your book puts it in a context that's really about getting to the heart of what do I need? What do I need to take care of myself? And, and it does it in such a kind and gentle and empowering way um, that, I, first of all, great for anybody who's teens and adults, but I also kept reading and going, oh gosh, I wish I'd had this as a reference when my son was three, so that I could understand some of the sensory things that he's going through and how to support him. I really, I was like, oh man, I wish I'd had this back then. So I think it's really for everybody, and um, and especially if you've got a kiddo who's nonverbal and you're like, so many parents will say, I just wish I understood. Ah, oh, I think this is your book. Um, just kind of crack that code and get in there. So let's talk about a couple of things. Uh, I've said that I think it's good for everybody, but you really do make the case that self-care for individuals um, that are autistic um It's a little bit different. Talk to us about, and the need for it is perhaps a little bit different. Talk to us about that. Yeah. So there's something you just said about the book that I really appreciate, which is it kind of invites people repetitively to consider what do I need. Um, And I think that is one of the things that is at the heart of autistic self-care is a lot of us struggle to know what we need. And so, you know, we might someone might say like go do some self-care and we might have a a blank stare like what do you mean it's partly there's well okay let me break it down there's a few reasons for this one a lot of the cultural connotations of what traditional self-care entails um, is not attractive to a lot of us and I'll give a quick example Um, so I have I have a mother and I have two sisters and sometimes um, especially a few years ago we would do like um mother-daughter retreats, which would often involve, like, going somewhere nice, but then the, the salon. To yes. me, that is a sensory nightmare. Thank like a spa you. day is, is not self-care. Yes. Um, so the culture, like, cultural scripts around self-care, there, there can be a mismatch there. The other, like, probably more deeper issue is around that whole idea of knowing what we need. And that goes back to a lot of us struggle with something called interoception, which is one of our sensory systems, and it's the ability to register accurately body signals. So that's things like thirst, hunger. Um, This is why toileting, this is one of the reasons why toileting is so hard um, for children, is knowing the urge to use the bathroom. Um, But emotions also rely on interoception. And so knowing what we need that I guess we could say that's an adaptive skill we need to learn and we need to also accommodate for. And so through cultivating a sensory lens, through cultivating awareness of our sensory system and through increasing interoceptive awareness, these are some of those foundational skills that actually help us know what we need. Another thing um, 
they can get in the way is masking. So for folks who do mask or camouflage their autistic traits, that can make it really hard. It's like their antenna is totally cued into the outside environment and not the internal environment. So that also makes it really hard to know what you need in a given moment or what you even want. Love what you're saying. Uh, and, and thank you. I, uh, uh, you know, when, whenever I would talk about self-care as a mom, people would say, oh, you need to go get your nails done. And I would rather be, you know, dragged behind the Budweiser Clydesdales. To me, that's like, you know, strangers touching my fingers and putting things on them. I No, thank you. That is not a relaxing experience for me. So thank you for saying that. I couldn't agree more. Right? <laughs> Um, and there's all kinds of noises in there and smells. It is not a thing for me. Um, but you, you said a phrase that I want you to help us to understand what you mean when you say sensory lens. Sensory lens, yeah. So uh, when I, I, I think, so I think in images. So when I think about a sensory lens, I'm thinking of like a camera lens. And it's the ability to see the world through that lens. So, um, for example... Um, earlier you mentioned the grocery store and meltdowns, and I'm curious how many parents, when they're thinking about taking their kids to the grocery store, are considering that through a sensory lens. So a sensory lens would consider things like, okay, what are the sensory demands implicit in this errand, both for me and also for my child? And then um, what decisions am I going to make based on that? It's also entails, so for one, it's the ability to see the implicit sensory demands in our everyday tasks. Um, and I think that's especially important for caregivers to cultivate, especially if they don't have sensory sensitivities. That might not come naturally to them, but it can be cultivated. The second aspect of cultivating a sensory lens is the ability to pers like make those connections between sensory irritants and our emotions or our behaviors so, for example, until I developed a, a sensory lens, which I didn't have until after I knew I was autistic, um, I would maybe think I was anxious or I was irritable, but I wasn't putting it together that what was happening is I was sensory overloaded. Or I would think I was, um, for, for me, which is, this is a pretty common response, especially among people who mask, I would respond to sensory overload by, like, low-grade dissociating, so I'd get really disconnected and foggy. Um, I had no idea what was happening. Now that I have a sensory lens, it's like, okay, I'm sensory overloaded. Um, do I want to get back into my body? If so, how am I going to do that? And so I have a lot more agency now that I have a sensory lens to understand what's happening for me. I'm able to parent my children so differently now that I'm understanding their reactions from a sensory lens. of like, okay, there's some sensory irritants here. Can I dim the lights? Can I reduce sensory input? Can I reduce sensory demands for this child right now? I think what you're saying is so important because I, I, I was making this case the other day that I think that being around um, autistic adults has helped me because no one ever taught me this, Megan, um, Dr. I'm calling you, I'm Megan. And I you can call me Megan. Uh, nobody ever taught me this. And, uh, and and it's interesting to me that I, the example I brought up the other day is Dr. Stephen Shore who said, I, you know, I can teach this college level class, but not with these lights. So can I wear a hat? And he advocated for himself and was able to be successful because it shielded him from the fluorescent lights above. That would never have occurred to me. I would have just been like, oh, I hate these lights and, you know, or not even have language that. It'd been like, I'm so tired at the end of the day and not have realized what it was. And I feel like the, the, the changes that have been being made in our society about bringing awareness of sensory is a gift that has been given to us by the autism community. I am somebody who has sensory issues. I think everybody does to, because they're just different. But uh, my assumption was that my sensory sensitivities were like something to be ashamed of, and my assumption was that my child did not have those things. Nobody talked to me. This is why I said I would have loved to have had your book. Nobody talked to me about the fact that he might be having sensory issues that were different than mine. And you bring up, we brought up the grocery store. My son would have a meltdown in this one grocery store in the same spot every time we would go there. And I could not figure out what was happening. And thank goodness I was working with a team of people who were looking at sensory things. 
they were able to come and observe what was happening. I was convinced because it was by the seafood counter and there was an octopus that was there and he would always ask to go see the octopus. We would go see the octopus, we would leave the octopus and 30 seconds after that he would have the meltdown. And my assumption was that it was because he wanted to go back and stay with the octopus. I was wrong because it was a sensory thing. The floor changed right where he was having the meltdown. It went from being a concrete floor that was, you know, painted concrete to a tiled floor. And his eyes were looking at that. I didn't know because he didn't have the words to tell me. He thought he was going to fall through the cracks. And so he was having a massive, I mean, turn the shopping cart over, meltdown, because he was afraid that I, that we were all going to drop between the cracks of it. And once we were able to identify that, we were able to help him, um, you know, through a whole bunch of different things, including having him get down and feel the floor, that it was solid, you know? And, and then the meltdowns went away. But I was so thankful that, because I would never have found that. I would never have realized that because I was busy having my own sensory experience. But I do love this idea that if we can all get a little bit more aware and maybe start with ourselves, but not have the assumption that our sensory issues are our kids' sensory issues, I feel like that's a great place to start. And and already, you know, there were so many things that I, I printed out the chapters because I wanted to talk about some of the chapters here. Uh, first of all, I want to talk a little bit about the culti- cultivating the sensory safety. I think that mm-hmm. is like, a, I, I want to say that was life-changing for me, reading that chapter. Oh, wow, thank you. Um, you want to talk a little bit about what you mean by sensory safety? Yeah, I mean, thankfully, right, we're in an age where this the concept of psychological safety, emotional safety, we're starting to talk about these things more. Um, but again, I think what you name really well is we don't live in a society that has a sensory lens, so we really don't talk a whole lot about sensory safety. But for autistic people or anyone with a sensory processing disorder, you can't really achieve emotional safety um, or behavioral safety or it's hard to regulate our attention if we aren't sensory safe because this is such a foundational system it's part of the nervous system so when we're sensory dysregulated our nervous system is dysregulated and then all those higher level systems are also going to be dysregulated Um, and historically a lot of the approaches we've had to regulate ourselves or children um, start with maybe behavioral techniques or emotion regulation And we're missing this really foundational piece, which is sensory safety. So by sensory safety, I mean um, whether we're cultivating it within ourselves or often in our environment, it is a place where sensory soothing is accessible to us, where we're able to limit or accommodate for sensory irritants to a way that we're not um, constantly being bombarded by, by sensory irritants and then entering into a state of Um, you know, fight, flight, freeze, because our sensory system is dysregulated. And I love that you explain everything so succinctly, um, but you very quickly get into things that we can do right now to be able to help. You've got, um, it says on the book that you've got 100 plus tips, and I think uh, that's way, that's a, that's a low estimate. (laughs) You've got so many tips for things. Let me read some of the chapter titles for you guys. Uh, Physical self-care. And underneath that, I I was just amazed at how many things you have here, like understanding your body's responses to stress. I think a lot of us don't stop to think about that. Uh, I loved the section on stimulating your vagus nerve for stress relief. Uh, And I really think that that's an important thing. part of the chapter for parents to read because sometimes our kids are engaged in what they call vocal stereotypy um, and a lot of times parents look at that and go well we need to stop that right which without looking at wait a minute what function is that serving and is that helping this child to self-regulate uh, I love that I love that right? can I is it okay if I add something there real quick please 
So, so something I talk a lot about, and this also came after I developed a sensory lens, is clashing sensory needs. So in that situation, right, um, a child might be using that to self-soothe. That might be causing an, a sensory irritant for the parent who is then getting dysregulated. And if we don't have a sensory lens for this, if we don't have language to talk about, like, okay, now my system's dysregulated, um, then we're going to enter um, code dysregulation really quickly as dyads. And I think um, I think that happens a lot in neurodiverse families because we have a lot of conflicted sensory needs. And without awareness of what's happening, that can lead to so much um, a sense of defeat, a sense of shame. And so I think having frameworks to understand these experiences is just so empowering. I know it's really changed the trajectory of our family's life. Absolutely. Well, it's... It's like it all starts to settle down and make sense, right? Uh, which is, is truly wonderful. I want to go on. Included in the, the physical self-care, movement and reg regulation, sleep. Oh, my gosh, I love the chapter on sleep. I, you, you had a resource in there that I can't wait to try. Um, I, I can't wait for my son to read your chapter on sleep. Uh, but then you've got body care and hygiene, absolutely uh, amazing. How You come at this in an entirely different way, uh, which I've never seen anybody do before, and I loved. Then Chapter 3 is emotional self-care, and it talks about autistic burnout um, and how to circumvent that, how to talk to yourself, what steps to take, uh, how to help yourself through that. You've got mental health resilience, uh, and I loved all the things in there. Chapter 5 is social self-care, self which talks about authentic relationships. Oh, my gosh. Every college graduate needs this about, you know, how to make connections and when connections are not good, right? But understanding, you know, I've had so many adults on the spectrum say to me, you know, I'm trying to find a love interest, right? And we, and we, all the programs say we got to start with how do you make a friend first before how do you make a love interest. But having that common ground, you have connecting through special interests, love this, uh, the double empathy problem. Uh, you go on to talk about interactions with neurotypicals. It's lovely. Healthy relationships, identifying red flags and green flags. I want to talk about that. Romantic relationships and, and negotiating all of that and different sensory experiences. But I also love that you talk about conflict and embracing an aromantic and asexual identity which is a very real thing in our society today, and especially within uh, the neurodiverse community. Uh, then you also talk about boundaries and self-advocacy. Another part of the chapter is emotional awareness, literacy, and resilience, emotional regulation, rec undercovering your raw spots and triggers was a thing that jumped out at me. Chapter four, I haven't even got to chapter four yet, you guys. Uh, chapter four is mental self-care, including autistic identity and interests, which is even talking about when and how to disclose. Love it. Self-advocacy and mental health care, because heaven knows we need that. How many times have we seen folks on the spectrum discriminated by the person who's supposed to be taking care of them, who just dismisses them because they've used the word autism? I want to slap people into the middle of next week, which is not productive, but thank you for this chapter. Autistic mindset and well-being. Um, chapter six, professional self-care, and it's all the things that people need to know for workplace. Oh, my goodness. Um, and I love that you've got executive functioning at the, at the end, which is all about goals and goal setting. Dr. Neff, this is amazing. This is an amazing gift that you've yeah. given all of us. I really am very excited about this. Uh, and I want to talk about all of it. We don't have time to talk about all of that. But... Um, I'd like to talk briefly, kind of touched on this before, but I want to talk about misdiagnosis of adults, girls, and you have uh, 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 an acronym here, B-I-P-O-C. I don't even know what that is. Tell oh, um, BIPOC or people of color. Oh, I didn't know that that's what that meant. What is, do we know what BIPOC stands for? Um, yes. Matter. It doesn't matter. Um, I just, I don't know that I've ever heard that, but... Uh, also, for, for gender queer, there's, there's mm -hmm. lots of misdiagnosis within these categories. What advice do you have? Because we have a large contingent of people who will watch the show 
and say, I think that I'm on the spectrum. I don't know where to go. I don't know who to go to. I don't know how to get a fair assessment that doesn't waste my time and money and that will actually help me. Yeah, and that's, I mean, I, I talk about this in the book, too. That's partly why so many, you see so many autistic adults um, self-identifying, because it there are so many barriers to di- diagnosis. You know, this is, I, I love the phrase, I didn't come up with it, but the lost generation of autistic adults, because these are folks who were raised, you know, 80s, 90s, sometimes 70s. Um, I, I have folks who are, like, 80 reach out to me frequently, um, where, because of what the diagnostic criteria was, and again, some of the, um, the the way researchers were thinking about autism back then, these are folks who might have gotten diagnosed with anxiety or depression, or maybe have a history of OCD, but um, they just weren't being identified in childhood as autistic. So, um, to answer your question, where should people go? There's um, a great website called Embrace Autism, and they have a bunch of screeners. Um, now, I always encourage people to rem- remind themselves that screeners are one data point. It's not the end-all, be-all, but it is a strong data point, and it's a good place to start. So, for example, um, the Autism Quotient, the AQ, there's an uh, adult version of that, and it's available online. Both Embrace Autism has it, some other sites have it as well. And then there's a really interesting screener that just came out in the last couple of years called the CAT-Q, which is the camouflaging. So this is going to capture people who are autistic but have essentially learned to move through social space analytically um, through um, copying, mimicking, repressing autistic traits. And I think that's a really excellent screener for adults to be taking as well. And then learning from the autistic community, however people like to learn, whether it's through podcasts or through social media. Um, There's a lot of autistic adults talking about their experience, and I think listening to other people's lived experience is a powerful way of also seeing, like, do I see myself recognized in this story? Um, And then if someone is wanting to pursue an official diagnosis, there are directories of um, assessors out there. So those are some starting points. Okay. I want to make sure that people know about where to find you and get more information from you because what a wonderful resource you are. Uh, your website is neurodivergentinsights.com. Uh, you are also on Instagram as neurodivergentinsights. Um, and your book, uh, which is out, I believe, is it the 17th that's officially out of March? Um. I should know that, should I? I, I believe no, that sounds right. It's, I it's should. that week, whether it's the se- yeah, yeah, it's just seventeenth or nineteenth. Um, and I'm assuming you can get it at every major bookseller, and that you probably can pre-order it today on Amazon. You can pre-order it, and if people are pre-ordering it, I actually am doing um, I'm doing a special promotion through my newsletter, um, which you, you can find in my you can get in my newsletter if you go to my website where you get, I also create digital workbooks, and you can get a free digital workbook if you pre-order this, and I have a digital workbook on sensory safety and sensory regulation, so if if that topic is of interest to people, um, then if you're pre-ordering it, you should absolutely take advantage of that promotion I'm doing this month. So they should go to your website, neurodivergentinsights.com, and then do they register for your newsletter, and that's how they get that... That's how they get that offer. Um, I could, I don't know if I'm able to pass links to you. I could give you, I actually have a link where if someone was interested specifically in that promotion, I have a link specifically for that where they could sign up. Um, if I'm able to get you that link, I could pass that on to you. Otherwise, if you're on my website, there's various ways that you can access my newsletter or yeah, through we, Instagram as well. When we're done, because I don't expect you to walk, talk, and chew gum at the same time, that's more than any of us can do, right? When we're done, send that link over to us, um, and then we'll be able to put it in the notes. But obviously, you guys, if you're listening and you don't have time for that, you can go to neurodivergentinsights.com. I feel confident that you'll be able to find the newsletter there and um, see how you can get because that's a good deal. You sign up um, to get the newsletter and get that the free workbook with the book, and you'll get the book. I love on Amazon. You pre-order or, or through or through this, you pre-order, and then it just shows up. And it's only two weeks away that it'll show up, and you'll be all set uh, mid March. Uh, absolutely amazing. Uh, I, I, 
I want to ask you, how does sensory awareness and self-advocacy connect? What's that piece? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think Stephen Shore's story that you told is a great example of that, right? And, and you were saying how how you wouldn't have had awareness if you would have known you were tired, you maybe would have known you were cranky, but we can't ask for the things we need unless we're aware of what we need. And that often starts with that sensory awareness of, okay, these lights is what's triggering my headache or this smell is what's triggering this. And so I, I'm therefore going to, you know, ask for an accommodation around smell or sight or, or I'm going to accommodate myself through self accommodations. But Again, so many of us lack that awareness that then when we don't have it, we can't advocate for, for what we need to um, navigate our environments more effectively. But I think it's an important, you know, we, where, how do we get to awareness? We start with just this level of awareness, knowing that that is potentially a thing, right? And for those of you who are like, okay, but the person that I love on the spectrum doesn't have... Dr. Stephen Shore's ability to communicate. Um, I think, again, this book is going to be really helpful to you as a person who is trying to be an ally to this individual so that because you take us through checklists and say, you know, let's take a look at what might be going on during this moment. And if, if the person themselves isn't able to do it, those of us who are there with them, we can make a good attempt. It doesn't mean that we're going to be perfect at it, right? But we can start looking for clues as to what might be going on with a person. I think we need to be, you know, systematic and careful and, and not assume that we've always gotten it right. But like, we got to be humble and say, I'm looking for those clues. I don't know that I've gotten it right. But that's a lot better than going, I don't know what's going on. And therefore, and I can't ask him. So we're just going to deal with the fact that they're clearly in pain in this moment. That doesn't ring true for me. Uh, let's let's try looking at things and see if we can figure them out. Um, your, so the book is not out yet, so we don't. But you are you are, as you said, an Instagram Instagram therapist, uh, and these are techniques that you have been using. I'm wondering if you can share with us anything that uh, you know uh, people have written back and said, "Oh my gosh, this like really was a game changer and helped me." I think a lot of the feedback I've gotten has been around, just I, I've ta I talk a lot about sensory regulation and sensory lens, so I think a lot of that, um, the other piece I get the most feedback on is around the nervous system. I talk a lot about how, you know, autistic people have what I call a more rigid nervous system. It's, um, try not to get too sciencey. Heart rate variability is one measure that measures essentially um, the health of our autonomic nervous system and how well it's systems are working together, that tends to be lower in autistic people, which is one of the reasons we more easily flip into a stress state. Um, and I think awareness around that and then learning how to do things like tracking the nervous system and and then working on training the nervous system, that's not been another area where I've gotten a lot of feedback from people. Amazing. Well, I really appreciate everything that you're doing. Again, the name of the book is Self-Care for Autistic People. Um, it is uh, available. I want to encourage you to go to uh, Dr. Neff's website, which is www.neurodivergentinsights. Also check her out on Instagram. Um, but if you'll sign up for her newsletter, you have the opportunity to pre-order the book and get a workbook, a digital workbook. Um, which is a pretty remarkable thing. So um, we hope that you will do that and, and continue to check out. I, I am Instagram illiterate. I just want to admit that, that I'm, I'm you know, and I'm, I'm being dragged into this century with Instagram. But uh, are you a pretty frequent poster on Instagram? Do you post a lot of stuff? Um, I post, I post strategically and intentionally. So I post, um, I do two infographics typically in a week and then I have one um, post of my pod, a clip of my podcast once a week so I post three times a week wonderful and if somebody is interested in do you ever do one-to-one um, -one? do you do it virtually with anybody do you are you available to that or that not your thing I am I'm actually no longer doing that um, I'm in the process of, of closing my practice, I do run a community, um, and I'm very engaged in there. And so I, 
I run community calls and community events, but um, I don't work one-on-one -on -one with folks currently. Well, I mean, that's totally understandable. You're out there. It's hard to make content and do all that other stuff. I totally, totally get it. Uh, well, I, I'm glad to know you, glad to know that this book exists. I hope that you guys will take advantage of this wonderful, wonderful resource. Uh, I know it seems weird, but, you know, it's my highest compliment. It's a great bathroom book. Uh, put it in the bathroom so that you end up reading it cover to cover. And, and I'm telling you, you know, just taking a couple of minutes and opening it up, not even, you, I love going through the chapters and saying, oh, here's what I want to know about today. But I also love the idea of just opening it up and reading what it has for you on that page and going, snap, that's really helpful and useful to me today. I don't know. There's something about that that's really uh, wonderful. So thank you so much for taking the time uh, to be with us today and for putting out this wonderful resource for everyone. We appreciate you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I'm just Thank realizing kind words. we've got like 30 seconds and I didn't, I didn't go back to, I want to know what all your neuro, neurodiverse thoughts were about the, the first, uh, the jargon. Oh, I even remember. they were all interconnected. It's a web. Okay. So I don't, it'd be hard to pull, um, no, like, pull them up. It's all right. But self-advocacy and, um, and adaptive skills and self-care and accommodations. I mean, all of those, there's just so much interconnectedness in that whole conversation. We love the interconnectedness, um, creating that web. Uh, so thank you again and encourage everybody to please pre-order her book, uh, Self-Care for Autistic People. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Neff. Nice to meet you. Thanks for having me. Nice to meet you too. Okay, guys. Uh, so I, what a wonderful conversation with her. What an amazing uh, resource she is. Uh, thrilled that we, we got through that. I have to give you a couple of programming notes for next week. Obviously, we have Dr. Grammy Shea back with us in studio on Tuesday. And um, I don't remember what's on Monday, but I'll get back to you guys on that. But I do remember that on Wednesday is our big Oscar show. So if you um, are interested when Moira and I talk about movies, that's that's the big Oscar show. So we hope that you guys will join us then. And thank you guys, everybody, for being here. Until then, give your kiddos a hug for me and one for you too. Bye-bye for now. If you found anything helpful in this video, please give us a like. In fact, make sure that you smash that subscribe button on YouTube and give us a like on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Instagram for important updates. And please download our free podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much. See you next time.